was introduced a bit over a year ago to uh, present and discuss uh, work on European politics, both domestic and uh, at the European Union level, and it combines different types of uh, seminars. And uh, the information is on our website. Today's seminar is a, is a research uh, seminar, and we are very fortunate to have Lisbeth Hoog and Gary Marx uh, presenting uh, uh, work, which is uh, a draft paper uh, already, on the social roots of the transnational cleavage, sex, education, and occupation. Lisbeth and Gary are spending the academic uh, year at the Schumann Center working on the ERC uh, project um, on topics relating to the, uh, to the paper uh, that you're presenting today. Um, you are going to give an initial presentation of about 40 minutes, and then we go straight to Q&A. To those in the room, when you speak, please make sure uh, to press uh, the button to switch on your microphone. Um, I think the camera then will turn towards uh, you. Uh, since this is a hybrid um, event, for those attending online, please keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking, but the, camera switched on if uh, possible, if your connection is uh, strong enough. And then during Q&A, we will alternate uh, with questions coming from the audience in the room and the audience uh, online. Thank you very much, everyone, for being with us uh, today. Thank you very much, Lisbeth and uh, Gary. I give you the floor. Uh, I think the camera will turn towards you. And I see that the slides are already uh, set up. Thank you. I think we prefer to um, uh, stand. Uh, we're just going to, this is actually going to be a joint presentation. Elizabeth and I are going to do this jointly. Um, our idea is that we don't actually speak simultaneously, but I'm not sure about that. We'll, I'm not sure, and I've got we'll already break it, it in the sense that we would prefer to stand, but if somehow this um, makes the transmission difficult, uh, could someone hybrid then uh, please let us know and we'll just adjust to this. It's obviously important that you understand what, uh, yeah. what we're saying. Yeah, we, we do realize we have two audiences, one audience, lovely audience here, and then behind us somewhere in the ether is another actually much larger audience. So um, you'll notice right away that the title is a little different from the title that was advertised. Um, the, the paper that we initially thought we were going to present, actually we've already written it, it's already submitted. It's kind of a technical-ish kind of paper. We think this is going to be more interesting, it's more substantive. It's a paper that builds out of a paper that we published in 2018. That paper was about the, it was a cleavage theory of party system change. It was from the standpoint of political parties. This is a kind of a a sister or a daughter paper um, that is that engages cleavage theory from the standpoint of voters, and that is the um, and that is the topic that uh, we're going to be um, elaborating. Um, so let's let's go right in. Yeah. Um, and we I want to start just by outlining the 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 theoretical basis, the basis that lies behind the uh, the work that we are currently engaged in. Uh, chiefly related to Lisbeth and in brackets and my um, ERC. Um, and this is really the, I suppose, the first paper that is coming out of that um, uh, ERC. Okay, cleavage theory. Um, the basis of cleavage theory, the kind of the, the inescapable basis of cleavage theory is that party systems are deeply rooted. They're systemic. They are a set of interconnected institutions that have some degree of responsiveness. So if you're gonna shift a party system, if you're gonna think about the conditions under which new political parties emerge in that party system, one has to conceive of some quite profound exogenous um, shock. That's the point of departure. And that is what we are thinking about in terms of this presentation. How can we conceive of an exogenous shock that launches, so to speak, a green and tan political um, parties. 
So that's the um, that's the kind of the, the, the basic point of uh, departure. Second, the medium of an exogenous shock with respect to party formation is grievance. And this comes out very clearly when you read the classic uh, Lipset and Rukhine of 1967. Um, it's an opposition. It's not a kind of a want to realize some status benefit or from a Marxian standpoint, some um, class um, orientation deriving from a new class. It's an opposition. It's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a set of grievances that arise in the course of a major exogenous shock. And when you li read Lipset and Rakan, um, just put in, which is what I did actually yesterday, um, put in the term opposition. That word occurs more than 100 times in that 1967 paper. So we're, we're, we're thinking through what are the grievances, a conception of the grievances that are formed in the context of a major um, exogenous um, shock. So um, grievance is the key word here, and we want to expose the social roots of grievances. And so this paper is really more informed by sociology, drawing from a sociological literature, and, and therefore complements, I think, a really uh, important and growing area, particularly in political science, that draws on politi political psychology to understand uh, polarization, uh, political conflict. Um, Matt, I think Matt Lewandowski, I think he's in the audience, he's not here, um, is, is one of the proponents there. There's several people here and also in the audience are. And that's uh, incredibly important. And for example, one of the things it's done, it's made us realize the, the role of emotions and the malleability of emotions uh, by entrepreneurs. So what we want to do is kind of ground this role of emotions in an understanding of, of uh, the roots, the social roots of grievances and uh, the reality of grievances and the roots. Yeah, because if you're thinking about a cleavage, we're talking about a durable conflict. We're not talking of some kind of fly-by-night set of, of preferences over some range of movable uh, political issues. So social rootedness really is a third kind of foundation of, um, of cleavage theory. So uh, a major exogenous shock that produces grievances that are uh, grounded, socially rooted. And so the things that we are putting kind of on the table, which we will be putting on the table in this talk, um, agenda, sex, well, that is, that is socially rooted for sure, very difficult to change. Um, education, well, once a person has received an education at the age in their mid, normally mid 20, not people around here necessarily, but normally by the time you're in your mid twenties, very difficult to change the foundation um, of, of that and class, occupational class. So these are the socially rooted foundations that we're going to be theorizing about. And one way of kind of, of, of compressing what we're talking about is that these are highly, highly consequential for people. And we want to show that in terms of the uh, characteristics of voting, voting um, intentions. They're highly consequential, but weakly volitional. Highly consequential, but weakly um, volitional. So what is that exogenous shock then in this particular period that gets the train rolling, if you like? It's the information revolution. And what do I mean by that? Well, in its simplest form, it's the growing role of information, technologically, economically, socially, in development, in economic development. And why is it revolutionary? Because it's been uh, driven by a series of non-linear um, innovations in uh, semiconductor technology, or you know, the thing that we all know best, the computer, and nowadays the laptop and the iPad and so forth that comes out of it, that has sharply reduced the costs of uh, information production, transmission, storage. And, and that has had an impact, we argue, on the lives of large sectors of our society. Not everyone, but and, and there's where we need to be precise, who is most affected by this, the lives and therefore the life chances of these people. And that has had both empowering effects and disempowering effects. And that's where the roots of grievances comes from. 
and, and so we want to get to the social rootedness of this. So in order to do this, we actually were kind of impelled in a sense to, um, to, to get outside, to move beyond the, the, the terms that we um, are most familiar with. And, and, and there's a movement in, in sociology, people like uh, David Grusky, um, Kim Whedon, who are making the argument that if you are really want to engage people's life experience, if you really want to get inside their life chances, you've really got to look at the particular groups to which they belong. And in occupational terms, these are the particular occupations. So if you're looking at patterns of social replicability, if you're looking at patterns of socialization, what these sociologists are arguing, and it makes sense for our particular purpose, is go micro, really pay attention to the particular occupations, the particular educational experience that shape individuals' lives and hypothetically their political orientations. Um, yeah, so this is actually a chance for me. I really get a chance to talk about my first book, um, which was called Unions and Politics, which actually with, which unselfconsciously did actually precisely this. It was an analysis of unions, the working class, in the 19th and early 20th centuries in Britain, Germany, United States. And the basic argument was this, that printers, when you look at particular occupations, you are looking at particular life experiences, and that has a, a major impact on the way in which groups conceive their political interests. So printers and coal miners, both core elements, members of the working class, from a Marxist standpoint, and often from a socialist standpoint, they are meant, in brackets, to share this singular experience as productive workers, not so. They had a different capacity for protection in the labor market. Printers were able to control the, um, the conditions of supply into their labor market. Um, uh, coal miners were not. Printers were able to form immensely powerful unions that could actually shape on the demand particular conditions unless they wouldn't work. And coal miners had to use force of numbers. And so that's an example, I just can't resist <laughs> mentioning it. That's an example where really you've got to go micro even to understand the so-called working class in the context of the industrial um, revolution. So, and that, so we've learned a lot by using these more abstract categories like production workers. We know by now that production workers, uh, Usher's term, are more likely to vote time. We know that higher educated people, particularly university educated people, are more likely to vote for green parties or social liberal parties. We know all that. But nobody really thinks of themselves as a production worker, right? That's not how you think of yourself or as a social cultural professional. You think of yourself as working at university, scientist, political scientist, social scientist, maybe a scientist. That's how you would identify yourself. And the same with production workers, you know, just go around and, you know, I'm a trucker, or I'm a miner, or I'm a, a metal worker, but not a production worker. So it, the, the micro approach invites you to go down to the lived experience of individuals, because that is where presumably, um, you know, that is what shapes uh, both practices and attitudes and values. And so and that's what we were trying to go to. Now, empirically, this is mostly a theoretical paper, but it is informed by um, dabbling with data, observation and analysis. And we use empirically the European Social Survey because it is quite rich in, 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 in enabling us to go disaggregate these abstract categories. And so, uh, with respect to occupation, there is, for those who are familiar with the data set, the ISCO categorization it goes up to 578 categories at the four category level, right? So you can actually unpack the notion of a production book, for example, and see what's, what's, you know, the variation within that group. And the same, perhaps less known, is that the European Social Survey, um, a few waves ago, did a couple of waves, three in fact, where it asked people to identify their primary subject of education 
I mean, we all know the, the le levels of education, lower educated to, to higher educated. But actually the field of education is, is quite interesting as well, potentially interesting, and we'll, we'll try to show that there is some um, theoretical and, 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 and empirical leverage in, in doing precisely that. So let's recap. What we're trying to do in the paper is the exogenous shock, the information revolution. How does that affect particular social groups and why does it affect these particular groups and how? And how does that give us purchase in understanding the emergence of two new party families? First phase, green parties, as of the 1970s, mostly 1980s really, and the second phase, the um, radical right parties, what we call the traditional authoritarian nationalist tan parties from the 80s, 1990s. Okay, so let's start so the two phases. Let's start with phase one. Um, we um, hypothesize grievances from two basic sources. The first, now we're, when we're talking about the information revolution, we're talking about the development of knowledge intensive occupations, a uh, information determined set of um, industry. Um, what we're interested in is those that are market insulated. Those that are, that are the, in the in, interstices of the capitalist post-industrial system. So we're not so interested in computer engineers or software designers, operation managers. Uh, the ones we're interested in are those that are detached from capitalist production. That is occupations producing information, for example, um, scientists, those involved in processing information, that's artists and, and arts designers, um, those involved in purveying information teachers. These are groups that are detached from producing things for, that are gonna be sold um, on the market, that they, they are detached from, from capitalism. And our hunch, and this is what we're gonna um, be intent on showing you, is that they have a, a predisposition to vote GAL, Green Alternative Libertarian Green Parties. So that, that, that's one thing, that's the occupational side of it. Um, but what's interesting, and there's a, a particular locus or location that's become very prominent in, in this whole evolution, and it's the university. Universities are in many ways to the information revolution, what factories were to the industrial revolution industrial stage in the sense that they are the location where a lot of these knowledge intensive market insulated people are being trained or work being part of it right um now what is important here what a micro approach invites you to do is to look inside the university and to recognize that there is variation within university and university educated categories. And, and there, along the lines that Gary was sketching, it's interesting to see the variation in fields, educational fields, and how people are educated or, or teaching in, in the fields of arts, humanities, and social sciences are more inclined to take that critical detached view of an industrial society and industrial market economy uh, by virtue of, of their education and their position in the university. So we would expect the, the tendency to vote green, to express green values and to vote green to be the greatest among those categories. Yeah, uh, look, our inspiration for this actually goes back to um, a really fascinating analysis conducted by Simon Martin Lips at Neverett Lads um, on the variation in the political affinities of those in the university's professors across different disciplines. And there are enormous variation. And the, what's at the core, so you, the engineers tend to be very conservative. The humanities people tend to be very liberal, or we would say, actually they virtually say without using the word, a gal being alternative libertarian. Um, and what's going on there? And if you kind of think through the argument in that book and compress it, there are two basic factors. The first has to do with the substantive character of the discipline. Those, the, the, the disciplines that are most open to creative thought, that are kind of less rooted in, in technique, um, that give the 
the um, a greatest possibility for, in, for uh, intellectual creativity tend to be those that are most agal. That's the first, um, first kind of logic. The second has to do with networks. That is those disciplines, for them it's disciplines, for us it's occupations and disciplines, um, that are least connected to the world of industrial production. Uh, that, are, that are the most intellectual, that have the least uh, business connections will be the most um, gal. And so this is the, actually these are arguments that were uh, proposed, first proposed by uh, Herbert Kitschout and Hans-Peter Kriesi yeah. with respect to the connection between knowledge society and the development of, um, of green parties. And, I, I, and that is the kind of the fundamental logic that's driving these um, expectations with regard to occupations and um, educational fields. It's perhaps also worth noting that according to OECD uh, data, about 25% of the students at universities are actually in the sectors of social sciences, um, arts and humanities. So this is not a, a small group. And so if you're thinking of the electoral logic, there is a potential basis for, for a mobilization. And which is kind of amazing, really. Yeah. You, you think of the development of a capitalist information revolution. And you say, okay, you know, you're going to get the expansion of the universities. 25% of those people studying at university are not really doing anything directly related to, to, to production. They're not operating in the context of the productive dynamics of an information revolution. They're not doing computer science. They're not doing engineering of any sort. They're, 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 they're studying English literature or German literature. They're studying um, their anthropology, anthropologists. There's a whole variety of subjects that were kind of drawn along in democratic societies. I mean, that's something I think will be interesting to yeah. explore. In democratic societies, the expansion of education was not capitalist dominated, at least in terms of the substantive character of the, um, of the disciplines. So this is the limits of a functionalist reading of, uh, you know, or an econ economistic reading of, of the of the development. I think it's not just, cannot be reduced to this. Um, you see something else there, and that is um, perhaps for us was one of the big surprises, and it is women. The, the, what, what overlaps these, these groups, these occupational and educational groups is the predominance of women. And, and this, is, this is interesting. First, the majority of students, as we know, at universities these days are women in um, all but, two of the 27 EU countries, that's the case. It's also the case in the US, it's the case in the UK. Gender composition of disciplines is, is very um, uneven, as we know. Women predominate precisely in the fields that we just identified. Men predominate in these technical fields. And it's interesting how that has shifted let quite in limited ways over the past few decades. And then in the knowledge economy, the economy itself, the occupational world, one of the big changes as a result of the shift from um, industrial society or economics to um, the post-industrial, the knowledge economy, is a shift from the need for brawn or muscle to, the, to brain or knowledge. And that's, of course, from a from a gender perspective, enormously consequential because there's, there's no two ways about it. The average woman cannot compete with the average man in terms of brawn, but that cannot be said with respect to brain. So this opened up a, a, a potentially, and this, I say the word potentially because that needs to be politically mediated, potentially a, an entirely new field in, in terms of the labor market. For yeah, women. and it produced grievances. So what women saw was the possibility for engagement in the economy in ways that were unheralded. At the same time, that made them, many educated women, all the more sensitive to the um, glass ceilings that they were subject to, that constrained them, and also patriarchalism within the family. And so what you see then is the development of opportunity, but at the same time, a, an, a, an intense recognition um, of the grievances, of the limitations that went um, along uh, alongside that. Well, that is the so that's so we're going to now introduce some data. I think we're yeah. going to have to kind of speed, speed up, up a bit. 
Okay, so this is the first uh, data graph, and these are these knowledge intensive market insulated occupations that, that we just talked about. Right, um, from, uh, and, and the thrust, these are data from the ESS, you can see it there. These are the individuals boxed in these particular categories. We've regrouped the ESCO categories to identify scientists, arts designers, social workers, and conventional health teachers. And then we juxtapose that with the conventional, more abstract category that we all know, the social cultural professions. This is the percentage of respondents in each of these categories that who vote green across 14 countries that had between 2008 and 2018, these, these are the, the ways we're looking at, have voted um, in, in the 14 countries that, that had both a gal and a tan party. So that, that's what we have. So what you see there, scientists, arts, designers, 22%. Um, you can't see it on the screen here, but it, it's important to compare it with the average green vote in the whole population or in the sample rather, it's 9.7%. So this is way higher than your average um, percentage across the, the population. 22% and you see the other numbers, you can read them. Um, somehow this, this should be a green bar and it's, it's gone. But these are the social cultural professionals. That's another interesting comparison. Social cultural professionals clearly vote more green than the average, 16.9%. But it's not, so it's not wrong at all to say that social cultural professionals are a core constituency for the Green Party. But it's imprecise. If you go and take a micro approach, you can actually identify uh, categories that are more strongly leaning towards voting green. But what's more, it gives you a, a different insight, and we think a more precise insight yeah. why these people are yeah. more likely to vote green. Because social cultural professionals, they're defined in terms of their communication, their communicative abilities. Um, in terms of their interpersonal work logic. We don't think that's, for, for this subject, in terms of explaining green voting, that's not what, what is critical. What's critical is um, knowledge intensivity and market uh, detachment. And those are the groups in the blue bars. I see a green bar on my screen here. I don't see one it's over here. Funny, yes, it's not funny enough, did you see it? Okay, now on to education which is often seen as the master variable on, on this um, emerging cleavage, which we call and will call in a minute the transnational divide. Look at the axis first, which is the baseline. That is the average green vote in the, in the sample, I should say, not the population, 9.7%, right? And then what you see there is um, the green bars, here they do come up just about, okay, show the percentage of green vote among those with post-secondary education or higher education versus the percentage of green vote among those with lower education. These are the traditional conventional categories we look at when we're trying to understand who's more or less likely to vote green or more or less likely to vote tan. Now look at the blue bars. The blue bars zoom into this category, the higher educated ones, and then unpack it by educational fields using the ESS data. And what you see there is a much starker contrast. So all these blue bars are post-secondary educated individuals. So, I mean, look, the variance explained by looking at field is greater than the variance explained in the conventional highly educated, not highly educated, which you'll see in a thousand articles that are written um, on this topic. It's the field that matters. And even to the extent that there are fields of post-secondary or university education, that are less than average green. So this really, the, 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 so when you go micro, you really get a handle on variants that you don't get with these broader macro um, categories. Yeah. Um, this is my favorite slide because what it shows is something that context matters. That's in one phrase that what, what this reveals. And, and it says this, when you look at the percentage of women, the proportion of women in an educational field, well, you're always going to see the a difference between males and, and, and females. Females will tend to vote green more than males in, in, in any context. But the context matters more than the individual propensity. So when you look at fields that are 80% female, those fields of these disciplines, 
you find a much greater propensity to vote green. So there's something about the context. There's something about the context. Well, you know, the way you think about it today is first resort self-selection, sure. Maybe there's some socialization that's going on. We don't know, we don't know. But what we can say is that when you put, and we'll see this even more strongly later, when you put men together, and when you put women together, you're dealing with different kinds of beasts. And somehow that context really does matter in terms of individual political behavior. So as, as Gary said, you know, this paper for sure doesn't engage in whether it's self-selection, whether it's recruitment, socialization on while being taught. Um, sometimes we university educators are being accused of brainwashing the kids that are entrusted to us. I think to the extent that research has a, has a view on this, uh, it, it seems to suggest that that bit, the socialization is relatively weak. I mean, that's more the self-selection. Um, self-selection, which can be, therefore, the prior values that an individual brings to making the choice, what am I gonna choose? Which could be their own values or very often, of course, parental values, because after all, those kids um, you know, are young when they make um, consequential choices. But what key here is, as Gary is suggesting, the field of study is, is a decision that has the capacity to shape a person's life chances. Um, it expresses at the same time that person's values, the values that are prominent in that person's social circle, whatever that circle is, and that is subject to, to research, their gender, and ultimately their proclivity to vote for this or that kind of party. And so the implication is that the transnational cleavage, and we haven't explained the word transnational, but that comes the next slide, depends on life-shaping life decisions that are taken early. And, and that once taken are weakly volitional. All right. So Phase two, um, the development of town parties, the sources of support for, um, for town parties. Okay, so that, that's the second phase of the information revolution uh, around the 1980s, it begins, produces the rise of town political parties, turns what seemed like a divide into a cleavage that becomes transnational. And again, I'll take you back to the technological underpinnings. So the revolution, in a semiconductor technology that slashes the cost of communication. And that by the 1980s uh, produces two things. One, production chains become transnational, global. And two, the flow of goods, services, and people becomes cross-border. And that to economic social development then is buttressed by some political decisions, institutional reforms, um, that we all know about um, the EU single market, for example, reforms that are essentially designed to order, regulate, but particularly facilitate those types of transnational exchanges. So the single European market, of course, here in Europe, um, a bunch of regional economic organizations across the globe, many of them um, as a reaction to what was happening in Europe, bilateral and multilateral trade agreements, uh, the most important ones, you know, NAFTA, WTO, 1994 and uh, 1992, rather, and, and also APEC, for example, um, elements that have a net effect of accelerating this transnational exchange and making tangible and deepening the life changing effects on particular social groups. Look, we have three. Um expectations, uh, hunches, or, or more formally, uh, hypotheses. Um, the first is about information vulnerable occupations. So we're talking about particularly those in jobs that are um, vulnerable to automation. Um, and these are semi-skilled workers. So you know, who are the kinds of people we're talking about? Um, we're not talking about so in the ISCO 08 coding or the ISCO 88 coding as well, we're not talking about the 9,000, if you know that, uh, that set of categories. And we're not talking about the 9,000 set of categories. We're talking about the 7,000 and 8,000. 
So we're talking about workers who um, work with machines, uh, construction workers, uh, drivers. Um, the um, OECD has an analysis of this that we're going to be using to, uh, to draw some uh, data, but they have a series of terms that I'm going to, um, I'm going to list, read for you. People who work with machines, who carry loads, this is drawn from, from, that, to, um, from that survey, carry loads who uh, dig, cast, mold, stamp, forge, cut, grind, weld, paint, seal, or bend uh, stuff, mainly metal or, 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 or plastic. So these are the people that we think, hey, you are vulnerable to the technological change that is being generated by the information revolution. Let's see how you, let's see how you vote. I will share some, uh, some preliminary data on that later on, but there's a second category, which we call the GAL reactive occupation. And there's, there's two types of them. One, one is the extraction workers say um, miners or um, stone cutters, uh, these types of people. Now, the core mission of green parties was to be critical of society as is, and in particular of the environmental degradation that threatens the life, not only human life, but life on, on this planet. Now that, of course, puts the green parties in direct competitive opposition to these uh, um, these extraction industries, which, which are about extraction of coal, oil, um, stone, and various other minerals, and who are obviously highly polluting by nature. Interestingly, miners and heavy industry were actually the vanguard groups of the socialist era. They were the heroes yeah. in, in, in acquiring equality, the redistribution. core of the proletariat. Absolutely. And now they find themselves, you know, the wrong side of history. So that must generate grievances in, 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 in this kind of world. That's the one group. And the other group are what we call the security workers or security officers. Now, these are people who are uh, infused by the need to protect law and order, uh, national pride, nationalism, um, also masculinity, right? The core, if, if anything, security is perhaps, if not the first, the second uh, occupation that emerged on, on this, you know, in, in human settlement. I mean, one say something like prostitution is the first one. Pr protecting women and families is clearly the second, so that's security. Um, these, these have been challenged by the diffusion of GAL-oriented concerns in public debate and in public policy, such as um, police violence, or at least um, under-emphasizing or not protecting women against, as, against violence, sexual violence, minority discrimination, or even bias, male bias in, in the workplace. And these, again, have confronted in a pretty direct way the core values of these particular um, occupations. Yeah. I mean, look, who are we talking about? Information vulnerable occupations and semi-skilled workers working with machines, machine workers, man, man and machine, man and machine. With these gallery octaves, we're talking about men, we're talking about less educated males. And um, there's a very interesting finding actually in the literature on, on um, segregation. There's been a decrease in horizontal, in, in vertical segregation. So they're, they're not, they're, they're, there's a greater proportion of women in some of these more high status occupations, but there's been an increase in horizontal segregation. In other words, the gender balance of different occupations has become more extreme over in the last 20 years. Um, so that's one thing. And, what, and think about what Lisbeth was saying about these less educated males. I mean, in terms of economic, this is so well known in the literature, in economic terms, worse pay, um, more insecurity, are worse marriage chances. They have worse marriage chances, these semi-skilled workers, the workers that we've been uh, yes, describing. Yes, author, David Autor and his course, this is a series right, of interesting there are a series of articles like about this. Um, cultural threat, yes. a loss of um, status, a, a challenge to patriarchalism within um, the family. So these are our, and 
let us see whether there's some kind of contextual effect when you put less educated males together or when you self-select into those groups. But let's let's first look at this uh, quickly. So these are, um, you see again, same graph. Um, these are the occupations that we identify as the first three metal workers, vehicle operators, construction workers are the um, information vulnerable occupations that Gary talked about. And then, then you see those two gal reactive occupations. Again, the percentage of, of in those categories that vote for traditional authoritarian nationalist parties is clearly higher than the overall in the sample, which is 9.8%. So you see that's quite a bit higher. And it's, by the way, also higher than if you look at the production and service workers, that conventional category, ah, which is again missing. <laughs> Just to kind of that is, like that. yeah, conventional category that is often associated with voting time. By the way, the one that's missing here is social cultural professionals. It does. Oh, oh, okay. oh that's nice. No, it just okay. doesn't work here. <laughs> right. Um, automation. Um, and this is based, this is 2019 OECD data. It's based on uh, data from 2014, not actually an evaluation of automation in the abstract, but actually sales of robots from the International Federation of, of Robotics, the three quarters of a million that had been sold by 2014. And what you see on the X axis is a measure, a sum of five indices of, um, of automation from um, no automation, low one particular characteristic out of these five to high all, um, all, all five. You can't quite see the characteristics there to the yeah. right there. You may want to read it's them. A handling, processing, welding, assembling, and dispensing. So you could automate any one of those five. It's the first three that are most relevant for us because these are the ones that hit these semi-skilled um, workers that we've been um, uh, describing. And you see here that the greater the vulnerability to automation, the greater the propensity to vote um, TAN. And then on the other side, you see the same thing with respect to green voting. And when you take the medium to high categories, you're dealing with about four times the relative propensity to vote tan rather than green by virtue of relatively high automation. So uh, about 60% of our tan core groups are actually uh, people in occupations that are exposed to quite a bit of automation, minimally two or two out of five, right? Yeah. So that is that is pretty substantial. So there's overlap between our tan core and automation. Sixty percent in our what we call the tan core, twenty five percent in the sample as a whole. So we're dealing with quite a quite a difference there. Yeah. So we are we are um, actually this is your another of your favorites here. Yeah. Um, it's back to sex or gender. So we know that males are more likely to vote tan. In fact, by variant in the sample, 11.7% um, against the overall sample, including women, then 9.8%. So there is, there is that bias. It's not huge, but it's there. Um, but maleness is not just an individual characteristic that we show here. It's actually also a group characteristic. And this is what is uh, actually quite striking. What you see here, being male in working in a male dominated occupation predisposes you to vote time. And that's substantial under a series of controls here, including the automation effect that we just talked about. This is highly robust. I mean, you can, doesn't matter how you model this, how you specify the, uh, the model, you get this very strong contextual effect. That is, and, and here we are dealing with the, the occupations we're describing, several of them are way over 90% male. And that doesn't make much of a difference to, to women, but it makes one heck of a difference uh, to, to males. And again, you know, what are we dealing with? Well, you know, you've got to find out. We've got to find out what we're dealing with. I mean, presumably we're dealing with a lot of self-selection into these occupations. Um, but I wouldn't discount the possibility of socialization. I mean, I don't know whether you've ever, I've actually worked in some <laughs> manual occupations in times after long all, past. After all, you're a myth. After all, and I had to get some you know, money yeah. to, for education and stuff. Um, and, you know, I know the kind of the, um, the, the, the kind of speech that uh, takes place in those very, uh, um, you know, sprung of kind of uh, groups. Um, so there's homophily for sure, uh, but I think there's something else that's going on there too. 
but it's just it's a fascinating like, we think it's a fascinating and interesting um, um, kind of uh, fact that we want to uh, that we want to explore yes but it, it cannot be reduced to individual characteristics such as being a gender gender such as education such as being located in one of these uh, occupations or professions so there's something else called location okay so that's 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 our that's the information that we have to put um, on the on the table so in conclusion this is tentative because this really is a look Lisbeth was working on the data 15 minutes before we walked in here so this really is in process this is not a this is not a, and it's more fun it's more interesting to give something that is in process because you can be more responsive you can learn more from the from from the discussion so what we we think there are three things that are kind of noteworthy about this first of all um, and here we're using a very kind of conservative or modest phrase it's plausible to extend cleavage theory uh, to, to the present. You really can, it does kind of make sense to put on the table a major um, exogenous change. Interestingly, an exogenous change that operates in two phases. Now Lipschitz and Rakan's exogenous changes, that is nation building and the industrial revolution also worked in two phases. The two phases of the industrial revolution were first of all, the development of the um, of the Manchester liberal elites who had grievances about uh, tariffs and about the cost of foodstuffs and about trade and restraints to trade. And then later, the development of a, of a proletariat. The same thing can be said, I won't say it now, the same thing can be said about the national revolution. So these things work, the, the effects take time to, to unfold. And that's what we um, detect here. Um, we also detect that there are real grievances that have been uh, outcome that have been generated um, in this process, and that those grievances generate opposition that is politically uh, motivated. And not only that, but there's some evidence, again, I'm being conservative, there's some evidence that these are socially rooted, that the groups we're dealing with are not simply going to turn around tomorrow and say, well, you know, an issue has changed. So there's something that is. Um, that is rooted there. In, in all of these prior cleavages, we're talking about relatively small minorities that were very consistent in their party affinities. Now, there's, always, there's always been a lot of um, volatility. So we have to be quite kind of careful in our measures of, you know, of what are the what's the characteristics and what are the implications of the social bases that we have, um, have, um, have outlined. Um, but it seems to be kind of, it's, it's interesting, minimally interesting, and perhaps a valid to think of the growth of green and tan parties in terms of a cleavage, uh, in terms of a cleavage theory. Um, secondly, um, gender, gender or socially constituted um, sex um, is absolutely a fundamental. And that's something we, came into this project with a hunch, and it's something that really deepened as we, as we grappled with, um, with the, both the theory and also with the, with the data. And it's something you don't find in the analyses of, of greenness. I mean, it is the fact that in a study of 17 parliaments, 10 green parties have as many female as male representatives. We've always known that. We've always known that women, educated women, have a slight disproportionate tendency to vote green. But what we haven't, I think, looked at is the real implications, the contextual implications of gender, you might say, interacted with education. So it's not a replacement of education, but it's kind of an interaction. And particularly when you take a micro perspective, and you start to say, okay, you know, let's get inside education and look at a disciplinary experience. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, just final few words on this. That's the third lesson or that we'd like to submit and for you to comment on is the, va the value of going micro, going underneath those conventional categories. And we think such a disaggregated approach has, has several benefits. One is, I think it produces more accurate predictions, more precise. Second, 
it, it makes one's expectations because they are more specific, more testable, and therefore refutable, which is, I think, always a good thing. And thirdly, I think it gives sharpness to one's theoretical thinking. It's, it guides, it has guided us to try to figure out what, what is it about the information revolution that does the work. And so it has guided us to its looking at the knowledge intensive occupations, but not the hardcore, almost the subterfuge, sorry, Adrienne, using your, your phrase here, but the, the kind of unintended growth of occupations that are related to, but not hardcore, to the information revolution, to the, their market insulation and how that liberates them to be more critical of the society as is, and to gender. Um, so, and, and, and how that um, both empowers and shapes grievances, right? Um, and, and what Gary said is true. And I think what you, um, let me just add to that, the two stages, the first stage in a way was grievances of an ascendant set of social groups, groups that really are in the lift, uh, increasing in status, higher status. And, and, uh, and, and the second phase is grievances of, of social categories that are see there themselves being sliding down relative to other categories. So right. They're intimately connected. Okay, well, thanks very much. Let's turn to the discussion and be very interested to hear any comments, questions you have. Very good. Thank you very, very much for this very rich presentation, both in terms of uh, claims, theory, and uh, data. We can open the floor for questions and comments. Um, we'll start in the in the room. Anna, if you like to go first. Thank you. Um, I absolutely loved the project. Um, it's fascinating. Um, I have two questions. Um, and I'm not completely sure how to phrase the first one, but I'm going to preface this by saying that they come from a very, very sexist culture. My grandfather used to say when I was very little that even the worst man in the world could do a job better than the most educated woman. Um, and I kept wondering, when we look at green parties, usually the first thing that I think about is long-term horizons or a long-term perspective. People who vote for the Green parties usually are people who have an idea about, well, the world might come to an end if you continue consuming all of these resources. And for some reason, probably also because I come from such a sexist culture, I tend to equate women with more long-term horizons because of the fact that they continue being very much more involved in childbearing and child rearing than men. Um, and I kept thinking when I was seeing these wonderful results about, um, about how men and women differ in their votes, well, when you take women together, they usually start talking about their children and they usually start discussing questions of sexism that they have been facing. And I think that more or less, almost immediately, you start thinking in longer term horizons just because you want to make the world a better and more hospitable place for your children. And also probably because um, you don't want your daughter to be exposed to the same sexism that you yourself have been facing for the better part of your life. So I was wondering when I was looking at the graphs in this very pronounced gender effect, if this also has to do with the nature of predisposition of people to have longer term or shorter term horizons. And the second comment that I wanted to make is that I know this paper predominantly deals with Europe, but I'm very interested in seeing how it kind of goes or travels to Latin America, for example, or the United States, because there we, first, we don't really have that many green parties, even though the Democrats are traditionally viewed as the party more in line with kind of environmentalism, but also because we have the ability to combine natures, right, at university. In my school, 
a very significant proportion of the people went into business, but maybe 75% of those who went into business actually combined it with another discipline which gave them some sort of an, uh, an outlet from this. Generally regarded as boring and very structured environment. Also, we know that in Latin America, quite a lot of people don't go into, into their tracks in terms of they can't find a job as an economist or they can't afford to live as an artist, even though they, they studied literature. So it would be very interesting to see what happens to those people who don't precisely go into the tracks that they were educated in. Thank you very much. Um, do you, shall I give it a shot? Or would you like to? Um, whichever, I, I can start and then I will just try to, because I think there's more questions. These are uh, wonderful questions, Anna, thank you for that. Um, on the first long time horizons, I think it, there is an, a grain of truth there that um, the green parties looked um, or brought to the political agenda a series of questions that were about long-term survival, first that's the existential world, but also long-term adaptation to a, a changing earth and, um, and, and how to kind of rebalance um, the relationship between humanity and, and earth. And if you go to ecological feminism, which is we dabbled a little bit in while we were preparing on this paper, this is actually, close to the argument that would be made there, that there is a similarity in, in the essence of femininity and the essence of, of nature, that it is, it's a, a, a congruence or an affinity that is uh, not so obvious for men. Uh, we, it, there is a footnote in, in the paper, we decided we didn't need this um, for, for this paper, but it's a very interesting point that you raise. Does it travel to outside Europe? I mean, this is another way in which I think we are conservative. So we're looking at our dependent variable is voting for tan parties and green parties. This is obviously mediated by uh, institutions, uh, most particularly the electoral system. So party, electoral systems that um, make it virtually impossible to produce new parties, are, you're going to have to look at other things. So that's one response. You'll have to be creative in, in rethinking the dependent variable. My gut sense, uh, and I know we have um, some other uh, people with American, uh, with deep knowledge of, of American politics, contemporary politics, is that it certainly travels to American politics, notwithstanding the fact that you wouldn't look at green parties. We do have a tan party now, um, you know, as we know, but not a green party necessarily. With respect to Latin America, the story is, is more interesting, more complicated. And I like the way you were kind of bringing in an added factor there, which is, I think, partly economic risk, which we are um, hoping perhaps to engage at some point, but which, which we bracket here. But the other thing I would say with respect to Latin America is um, we're just coming out of uh, a new data gathering exercise of, of CHESS, the Chapel Expert Survey that is now traveled to Latin America. And what comes out of it is, is that the ideological structuration is much more still along the economic left-right. And so there are, there, there, there are echoes of um, the Galtan um, polarization, but they're, they're much weaker than they are in most European countries. But let me just add a couple of points to that. Um, I'm actually skeptical of the uh, of a kind of a or sex uh, approach in terms of female character or male character, because the 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 voting, the political behavior and attitudes are very conditional. Women used to vote for Christian democracy, and men were more in a social democratic. You know, so what? So there's nothing kind of fundamental um, um, about this. It really is the way in which uh, gender has been motivated or mobilized in the context of larger social changes. I think that's the, the, the core of, of our story and we should make that a very um, explicit. In terms of um, Latin America, um, what, um, what we, we, first of all, we don't, in, in this paper, we don't look at um, national variation. What we can say, is that we have the same story across each of our countries. So it's not dependent on any one country. And generally our 
hunch is that the more economically advanced, I'm not going to define that right now, but you know, let's give that a shot in terms of the ways in which one can do that. The more economically advanced, and certainly the more female or gender advanced a society is, the stronger are these results. So we find them particularly strong in, uh, in Scandinavia. Now, by that same logic, you know, we can make a guess about Latin America. In Latin America, we're not going to find the, the, these results nearly as, as strongly um, entrenched. And what, you, and what you find is that in Latin America, we have a paper that's actually on the dimensionality of, um, of, of uh, attitudes in uh, political attitudes in Latin America and Europe. Latin America is much more dominated by a left-right. That is the distribution of the, the classical economic left-right is much more dominating of attitudes or it's, it's much more able to summarize attitudes in Latin America than it is in, in Europe. So this second dimension, this Galtan dimension is weaker there for good reason. That is these countries are less economically developed. The information revolution, which would be one way of putting it, is less developed in these societies. We now go online, um, Hans-Peter Krisi. Yeah, I, I, you, you are not surprised. I, I feel very close to what you, what you have to say. So I think you are very close to my own thinking. It's, it's actually quite complementary, but there is one difference uh, which I would like to point out and which I would like to ask you about. It's your starting point. Your starting point, the exogenous shock is technological. Uh, in my case, uh, the first phase was very much determined by the cultural revolution, uh, the references to Ingelhardt, but uh, it, it could be to, to other authors as well. And the second phase was very much determined by globalization as an exogenous shock. Uh, globalization as delocalization of, of uh, the work of these uh, male production workers, which you also put into evidence as being threatened by automation, uh, globalization as a, a multicultural society, which uh, threatens traditional uh, kind ways of living and uh, globalization in terms of uh, European integration as far as Europe is concerned, so political uh, undermining of the nation state. How, in your view, are these three exogenous shocks, the technological uh, revolution, which you put into evidence now, the cultural revolution of the 60s and 70s, and the globalization, which has increasingly become important from the 80s onward. How are they related? Um, yeah, no, they, they're obviously related. Look, nothing We can't hear anything. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, you can. Good, good. Look, yeah, the points that you're raising are, are, are very good, very broad points. I mean, these things have got to be related in, in some sense. Um, but to say that something is exogenous is simply a decision about what you actually want to put on the plate. And so we think, well, look, we're not going to explain the information revolution. Indeed, most technological change has some kind of social political underpinnings. 
I mean, it doesn't just arise out of, uh, out of um, thin air. Um, what we do argue is that on the basis of this technological shift, and also we are very interested in the cultural implications of this and the cultural dimension, because when we're talking about gender, um, you know, it's directly engaging the cultural dimensions of precisely the 1960s, really 70s uh, uh, um, and 80s. Um, our point really is that um, gender itself is at the core of this. And when you, although, although you know, we didn't realize this, this at the time, I think in retrospect, the fundamental transformation of the information revolution and of the 1960s, 70s was in relation to the role of women and men in our society. That's the argument. And in retrospect, it seems obvious, but actually, if you go back, Hans, Peter, if you go back to your, um, your 1968 article, this wonderful article, um, article, um, you actually, gender doesn't, um, you don't engage gender in the analysis of, of greenness. I actually checked it just uh, the other day. So for us, the information revolution at the core of this, as Lisbeth was mentioning, was the shift from... We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay, test. Yes. Um, I'll just put it here. I'm sorry, do you want to pick up on that? Um, no, I, th I, th I think this was, this, this, this was, I think we are more in agreement perhaps than, than you think. I think part of it is also how distal you place the exogenous element. So in our story, the cultural revolution would have been made possible because of um, the technological advances that began to shift, um, you know, had impact on, on various sectors in society, including the educational system, led to the expansion of the education and generated a, a larger group of people um, in, those, in those educational fields um, who could be the carriers or actually the vanguard of the cultural revolution. That's one. And in terms of the second phase, totally, I actually was going to mention your work about winners and losers. That is precisely, I think, uh, very closely related to and, and specific with respect to European Union countries, um, what we have in mind. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to the room. Uh, Adrian, next. Thank you very much for Occupational 
you want to just click something? No. Okay. Uh, There's a very interesting uh, uh, question. Um, so after you. Challenging here. Yeah. Um, let me start with the changing party offers. Um, in in our um, 2018 paper, we make the argument that parties have brands that are pretty deeply rooted. So it's very difficult for a party to change its spots. What they can do is they're, they're on a daily basis, really even an hourly basis, the leaders of political parties are developing, are responding to actual events. But to change a Green Party, say from a pro-environmental to something that would be neutral on the environment or even like anti-environment. So the basic character of parties at a dimensional level is pretty much, is, is pretty rooted. And so, um, and, and that helps us do one pretty important thing. It helps us explain why the mainstream parties were not able to encompass the, the new cultural cleavage. They tried to, and they had as much information as anybody around the state, but much more so because their existence depended on it. They weren't able to do, why were they not able to do it? Why have the mainstream parties declined? Why have green and tan parties risen? Precisely because parties are pretty rooted. It's very difficult for them to encompass uh, new issues. And so our, our analysis focuses on the, the core of brands of these parties. And, that, and therefore for green parties, it's those gal issues. And for town parties, it's those traditional authority and particularly nationalism um, um, issues. And so I'm, I think one can get some, you know, if you really kind of go in to parties on a more kind of hourly or weekly or even monthly basis, you'll see interesting shifts. They're always shifting. But in terms of the basic character of the party system, I think things are pretty, uh, pretty rooted. Um, Who is driving um, the debate? I think you know, the people who are driving the debate are the, the chiefly the people in the media and the party, particularly the, um, the party leaders. And so what we're kind of interested in is trying to find out beyond that e evanescent and very flexible set of debates, is there something that we can describe as um, structural? Are there certain basic features of a party system and characteristics of support in the context of that party system that can be durable over time, because cleavages do tend to be durable over extended periods of time, at least measured in years and even in uh, decades. At least that has been the case. We go back online, Philippe Pencher. Uh, yes, thank you, Lisbeth and Gary, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions and they're both related to shared life experience because shared life experience seems to be the core of your um, going micro program. Now, the first question is very simple. Uh, you know, shared life experience, your proxies is through shared life in professional life and professional life in phase one is proxied by educational field. And in phase two, with respect to town parties, it's proxied by occupational field. Is that difference important? You know, maybe a very small question. The, the second question is, you know, shared life experience happens not only in professional life, but also in private life. Now, you may argue that private life is just a derivative of professional life, but I'm not so sure, since you find that, uh, you know, gender matters a lot, changing gender relations and changing family structures may play a role. Um, there's, there's a tendency to less stability in uh, partnerships, more people live alone. And, you know, as far as I know, um, females are better able to cope with being on their own than males. 
And how does this factor into your analysis? Because grievances can also come. Yes, thanks, Philip, um, for really great questions. In terms of the first, the shared life experience, um, phase one, um, education, phase two, occupation, that's not what we have in mind. We actually uh, look at both education and occupation for each of the phases, but what we're trying to, by looking at both, we, we're trying to detect to what extent there are similar patterns in both occupational and educational experience. So this may be part of, you know, something that wasn't entirely clear in our presentation, but it isn't such that these are just separate stages in development. In terms of the importance of private life, you're absolutely right. What we begin to do in the paper, and we decided not to focus on it uh, for the talk, um, for clarity, is also look at the, the role of um, partners, um, partners, so, so similarity or dissimilarity of partners in terms of occupation and education. Um, and also, to some extent, parental um, socialization. These are, the ESS has some data on it, not as good as we would like it to be, but it's remarkable that uh, for both uh, TAN voters and, and the green voters that we're most interested in here, there's a lot of uh, parental and, parent and partners homophily, I would say, that is, um, and, and it matters. Um, the paper has a graph that shows that if your partner has the same educational level, and this is a simple, we had to go down to the simple higher education versus lower education. If you have a partner with the same educational level as yourself, you're, um, you're more, much more likely to, to vote green. Um, if you have a partner with a different education, you're much less likely to vote green. I mean, it's a very significant difference. If you don't have a partner- I mean, high, Higher education. Same higher education. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, so if you have a partner of the same higher education as yourself, you're much more likely to vote green. If you have a partner with a lower education than yourself, this actually depresses your likelihood of voting green, which is consistent with an element of something is going on there. Again, you know, given the data that we have, we can't really sort out whether this is self-selection. I mean, why do you choose a partner who doesn't have your own education or whether that is something that happens in the relationship? But the, the patterns are pretty clear. Um, there's also very clear cross-generational patterns that, that seem to um, suggest that we live our lives uh, indeed in, in echo chambers, right? Um, in, 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 in social circles that are likely to process the information and the experience in similar ways as we do. And, of the, and therefore, and this is where and I hypothesize, may uh, reinforce our own inclination rather than question them. We'd love to go further to that, but I think we would have to turn to, to different data like panel data to, to, to probe the, the various effects much more systematically. We're back in the room. Uh, room All right, thanks for that uh, presentation. There's um, sort of results in the fascinating, and I think it makes this a lot of sense as well. It's, it, it, it's intuitive. The thing I want to sort of push a bit more on um, is the role of selection in all of this. And I think selection is really important, not just as an interpreter, but it's really important to read to what extent there's selection here. Um, and in terms of the, the, the framework that you presented, the argument that was that it's about life changing. Event. So there's a, a life changing environment that you interact with. That means that it should, there should be an effect independent of self selection for that argument to sort of um, be the cause or, or, or the effect. We also think that um, it matters if you think about how we used to think of what um, explains people choices and how we thought about the relation between different um, uh, indicators and sort of if. If you think about the image of the fund of causality, which is an image that I like and that lots of people um, use, you would have class, for example, coming first. And class is something that to some extent you're born in, uh, much like religion, it's, it, it's not, there's less selection in there for sure. 
And hence, it makes sense to argue that those social demographic features or characteristics are going to influence your values and then you vote. So if we switch to occupation that means fields of education, for example, if those are to a large extent driven by selection, then in a sense you're flipping around the order of social values versus values. Um, so that if values determine your occupation or the field of education, um, it, it's sort of flipping things around or it's it, the causal order sort of is, is upset. And even if in terms of predictions, um, uh, uh, you, you get a lot further, further with focusing on occupation and education of fields and with the wrong categories, if you lose the sort of causal claim as a consequence of it, um, I think that, that, that really matters for the identification of, of, of the findings. Yes, no, the very, very interesting points. Um, first of all, we do, you know, we find quite a lot of intergeneration, intergenerational continuity. And that works not simply with occupation, but it also works with education itself. So your parents' education really matters, and there's a tremendous degree of continuity across parents and, and, and children. Um, but imagine a situation in which, so we are, we are agnostic about socialization and, um, and self-selection. We suspect there's some of each, but in many cases that, so for example, in recent analysis of, um, of, of rural versus urban location and the effect of that on polarization, on the, 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 the bottom line seems to be that it is um, self-selection. That is the individual characteristics. Um, and we don't doubt that you can always reduce some kind of contextual effect to individual characteristics at some point, if one's imaginative enough in terms of bringing in individual, um, individual variables. But imagine a situation in which it, it, it seems plausible that women decide that they want to go into the humanities and the arts, and it's some kind of values that um, so there are two kind of questions there that one would really want to probe. W where do the values come from? I mean, we don't think that they're actually, they're actually based in sex. It would have to be gender in some sense, that socially constituted sex. Where does that social constitution come from? Why does it vary over time? So values themselves are not just kind of the starting point. They can also be, you know, a, a dependent variable. And then the second thing I think wants to take into account is um, what happens when you've actually made the decision? To what extent are you kind of funneled in a particular direction? And the data that we showed for um, education applies also to people who are 70 years old. So when we say you had a humanities education, we're not talking about students. We're talking about people throughout the, um, the sample. So there's something about kind of a channeling What's going on in that in that channeling? At the very least, it suggests that values are pretty deeply impregnated into a into an individual, and so and then you have to say, well, what's you know really what's going on there? And I think with any kind of interesting research in a way, what we've done is we've raised more questions than we provided answers. I mean, we really find that contextual effect puzzling, and I think. The kind of data, as Lisbeth was mentioning, the kind of data that we would need are having to come out of, out of panels very carefully. And a lot of the panels don't provide information about uh, the particular field. They, they, they provide information about your level of education. What we're saying is the field matters as much or even, even more. So I think you're raising you know, key questions um, that um, you know, we're just going to have to kind of wait and see people trying to grapple with them. I'm now going to uh, collect because we otherwise we run out of uh, time. So, uh, in that order, Anya Thomas, uh, Errol Kuhn, and then in the room, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Anya, please. Thank you very much for a very interesting project and a lot of uh, food for thought. My, I have two points. My first point relates a little bit to what Philip said, but my question is not about your model, but about the methods um, with whom you, with which you, you will respond to these questions about life worlds and group dynamics. I just wonder if you, I mean, it's you're very, you've you've dis 
greatly disaggregated your data, but can you really get to what you call micro, so to the group dynamics without doing using any kind of qualitative method, I don't know, focus groups or something. If you think of the work of Lazarsfeld on Marienthal, for example, so that if you really want to get to answers to some of your questions, I, I wonder in how far you should, should mix that um, with another type of, of method methodology. And the second question links to that is you have, I mean, if you want to find out something about the context, for example, of these disciplines at the university, I mean, these um, these contexts have changed so much in the time span that you want to say something about them. For example, the disciplines, you say, for example, the educational and humanities disciplines, they have been reduced. For example, recruitment, recruitment to these disciplines has re been reduced in recent years. So how do you factor that in? Thank you. Oh, we're collecting. <laughs> um, I, I guess I have a... I'll try to keep it short. I have a, I have a question, or, or there's a, there's a puzzle here that 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 I would like to hear your thoughts on. Um, if if the information revolution, basically a, partially a change in technology, is at the core of this transnational cleavage, um, why is technology not the kind of core issue around which both Gal and Tan parties are 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 structuring their rhetoric? Um, in the sense that a lot, that it's it's similar, I guess, to Hans Peter Kreese's question. Um, but a lot of the kind of rhetoric is around immigration. It's about trade. It's about the environment. But you know, in in, in other kind of events in in, in Lipset and Rokan's um, um, framework, right? Cleavages emerge from events, and then the party systems, the way they structure around them, are, are related to those events, like center periphery things like that. And I've seen less of that um, with with this with this cleavage. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. It really speaks to some work I'm also doing on uh, occupations classes, so I found it very interesting. Um, I have two brief points. That the first one also speaks to some, um, some points that have already been raised about uh, technological change. So if I understand correctly, so at, at the basis of this information uh, revolution, this technological change, so we provide an example of computers. And I, I mean, reading the literature, I, yeah, I, I agree that those who lose from from this revolution tend to vote for radical right parties, so pan parties. But at the same time, as far as as I read in the literature, the, those uh, those people who, for their education, have benefited most from technological change. And here I'm referring to. Work by Thomas Kuhler and uh, Aina Gallego, they tend to vote more for conservative parties. So they tend to vote for stability, they, they tend to vote for uh, incumbent mostly. So, how does it fit with your, with your framework? And, and secondly, I don't know if you um, are aware of some research done by uh, Carlo Baron and colleagues in Sciences Po. They, they precisely work on uh, class schemes and micro creations, and they show that. Micro occupations sometimes are better predictors for some outcomes, including uh, voting choice. Then the work is, is merely uh, methodological, but, but perhaps you can, uh, it could be interested in that. Thank you. Um, you can, why don't you go and I'll see? All right. Uh, so, like Anya, um, yes, that is, um, it makes a, a heck of a lot of sense to um, look, there, there could, could be an anthropology of these, you know, if you're really trying to get in at the micro level, mm -hmm. you're opening up a, a set of, you know, one should use the, the, the approach, the method that, um, that makes sense. Um, and certainly the kinds of things that Philip raised in terms of getting inside the family or getting inside people's living arrangements right. is going to be, um, it's going to, yes, like uh, Hock, Hockschild, um, that, that wonderful book on, on uh, American conservatism or radical conservatism is precisely that. And I've, we've learned a lot from that, from that book. And in a way, what you can say is our project is an attempt to systematize some of the things that, that she has, uh, has looked at. So just a wonderful. Um, in terms of um, Errol, you know, why is technology um, not a core issue? In the same way that the Industrial Revolution wasn't a core, there were Luddites for a while, who people who wanted to turn it back. But 
that was very brief and it seemed to be impossible. It seemed to be a, 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 a no route. There are people, uh, leaders who go and speak among the miners and say, you know, you, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna impose environmental restrictions um, on you. Um, and particularly in the United States, we, when we look at American, if you look at Fox, you'll see those kinds of things, those kinds of segments um, all, all the time. Um, the, 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 the extent to which, the way in which technology enters the debate is often in terms of national barriers, trying to block out a trade penetration, trying to emphasize the role of the nation, trying to exclude the United Kingdom from the movement of, of labor from Europe and, um, and beyond. And that's a very interesting, so you know, technology is kind of mediated in the way that it enters um, political, uh, political debate. Yes, very quickly on, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Giuseppe. Giuseppe, Giuseppe. very quickly. Um, the greatest beneficiaries of the technological revolution vote for conservatives. Yes, I'm, I'm not surprised. So we, as we argued in, in, in the talk, um, the, the carriers, the vanguard of the green parties are not the, the hardcore who's actually driving the, the technological um, the information revolution. It is the is the it's the occupations and and the fields, the educational fields, who've come along, who have expanded in the wake of um, this uh, information revolution. The the ones who own who, who reap the greatest benefits and and own the the you know much of uh, have the property rights over it presumably are always going to vote conservative, that is conservative to the extent that conservative parties are actually in the driver's seat, right? So and I think that's not inconsistent. Right? We wouldn't expect those to be at the vanguard of, of because they are the, they're part of the establishment. Um, this relates a little bit to a, a point tangentially that Anya made um, about the changing context and the pressure nowadays on the arts and humanities, and particularly in that the humanities, and the and the pressure to be more socially relevant, which is a soft way of constraining, I think, the the more freewheeling um, academic freedom or the freewheeling thinking, critical thinking of of society in the long term. Um, um, I I think that in the United States it's, it's very patently clear that education and particularly education is now very much at the heart of the battle, right? And there is a serious pushback from the backlash, what we would call in Europe, the TAN parties. In the US, it would be the TAN um, components of the Republican party. That was to be expected. So there is, there is counter, there's a counter movement. Um, I think you should see the, the same similar pressures, much softer in Europe in, in that context. It's because of the second, stage and the, the the second wave politically then i think we see that that pressure i was just going to say in terms of um, education uh, um, the most recent survey um, of the oecd finds that 11 percent of undergraduates are in the humanities and a further 10 percent in the social sciences so the humanities are under the cosh so to speak but you're still talking about 25 percent of students mm -hmm. who are working in areas that have no direct relation to the um, to the means of production in a capitalist post-industrial society. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We it's past the two p.m. The seminar comes to an end, but thank you very very much for a very rich paper presentation and a very good discussion around those uh, themes. Thank you, everyone, for. Uh, your participation both in the room and uh, and uh, online. Good luck with the project, and I'm sure we'll hear more uh, in the coming months during your stay here at the Schumann Center. Um, we'll reconvene in two weeks' time, and we will have uh, as a speaker Professor Stephanie Hoffman, uh, who joined the European University Institute recently with a seminar on navigating a dense institutional environment, the EU regime complexity and connectivity power. And we will be again in this same room with a hybrid, um, with a hybrid uh, event. So I hope many of you will uh, be part of it uh, again.
Thank you very much. Thank you.